This is Matt Hurt at Obsessive Viewer on Twitter. This is Tiny at Obsessive Tiny on Twitter. And this is ObsessiveViewer.com's The Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Obsessive Viewer. We're a weekly movie and TV podcast that covers a specific topic, be it genre, trope, movie, or show. Each episode, you can find back episodes at ovpodcast.com. You can find the blog at obsessiveviewer.com. And you can uh, subscribe to the subreddit at r slash obsessiveviewer. Or, and or really, you don't really have a choice on it. <laughs> like, you can do both. But you can also join the new Facebook group that we just created. Um, the link's in the show notes and at obsessiveviewer.com. Uh, so basically, the Facebook group is going to be a new place for listeners to... Um, share their thoughts on movies and TV with us and thoughts on the podcast and everything and kind of, you know, mingle. And so it'll, uh, that'll be, that'll be really good. And we need you to actually go and, you know, interact because if it isn't, then it's just us talking. It's all basically the time. this. And I was just thinking, text, that. yeah. I kind of talked myself into a corner at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it'll be, because if you guys don't do that, then it'll basically be the thing that you're, you know, subjecting yourself to. Yes. But um, no, it'll be a really fun way to interact with us and get some good feedback and get some interesting uh, conversations going. So, Tiny, are you excited about the Facebook group? So excited. Nice. I am too. And I'm glad that you and. Uh, Mike are both on board with it because I kind of just sprung it on you guys. Yeah, you did. Um, yep. Mike is our co-host who's on sabbatical from the podcast. Yep. Yes. Okay. So anyway, that's at Facebook. Uh, just, you know, find it. Um, just find it. <laughs> it. I have links all over the place. You, you won't be able <laughs> to find it. If you like what you hear and want to support the podcast, please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. The more ratings and reviews we get, the easier it will be for people to find the show in iTunes' search results. And uh, finally, if you want to share your show your support with your wallet, you can do that by clicking the donate button on obsessiveviewer.com, or you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer, where you can choose from a bunch of different reward tiers. I think I'm actually going to add a couple to it. So I think like for like maybe $3, we'll let you plug your, or not let you, well, you can plug your site or podcast or OK, Cupid account, whatever you want. We'll let you. We run a tight ship around right, here. Right, right. We will allow it. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, that was supposed to sound so much. It sounded so much better in my head. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so there are a bunch of different reward tiers, and uh, that's at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Or you could fashion a new wallet with the obsessive viewer logo on it. That would be amazing. But you have to show people. That's, yeah, that's true. It's another way you can support, support us with your wallet. That's you can. I mean, we will sue you for <laughs> copyright infringement, but that's fine. Or that's trademark. Awesome. I don't know what the difference is. But anyway, any donations uh, made will be will help pay the fees to keep the podcast running, uh, so we can continue to provide. To, we so we can continue. This is the worst part to flub. We can continue to provide you with our weekly podcast ramblings. <laughs> that's great. Um, and uh, we talked last week in uh, OV one eighty about how Matt and Draco. Yep. Yes, that's I because I re-listened to one of the past episodes and I don't I didn't know how to pronounce it, but Andreco, Matt Andreco, he uh, he uh, basically became a patron, and because of that, we may be able to up our uh, storage capacity this month in case we need to. Because I think I'm going to try to get uh, Fekus and potentially his brother on for a bonus episode about Suicide Squad. Nice. Yeah. It's about time we have Peter on. Totally. Yeah. I totally agree. And he, uh, but I haven't heard back from Robert yet. Um, <laughs> and also, this is all a moot point because this episode is going up in like two weeks anyway. Oh, or shoot. Next week. But anyway, um, finally, 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 I promise, um, <laughs> uh, tickets are now on sale for Shocktober and Irvington 3, uh, which is a one night event screening of short horror films from local filmmakers here in the Indianapolis area. We're going to have a nice raffle with, uh, uh, DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, gift cards to Irvington businesses, and it's a lot of fun. It's our third year doing it. We have a promo that will be, pl be played later in this episode. You can find more information as well as a link to buy tickets at shocktoberinirvington.com. And as a special bonus for listeners of the podcast, you can get $1 off the price of admission when you use the promo code PODCAST1. So, oh, that was a lot of talking. Tiny, It was. how's it going? 
You know, it's going very well. Good. It's going quite well. Very good. Are you ready to do some podcasting? I'm ready to potpourri. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you, okay, do you want to tell uh, our audience what we are talking about today? I'd be happy to. Today yes. we are having uh, extended potpourri. Which potpourri is the section of the podcast where we can talk about whatever we want, uh, what we've been watching, what we're looking forward to, anything as long as it smells good. I usually say that, and it's, it feels so weird hearing other people say it. Yeah, I, love I basically it. just mimicked you. Nice! That's so, awesome. Yeah, mimicry is the most something form of flattery. <laughs> right. Something about... It's... Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. <laughs> nice! <laughs> Oh, that reminds me. Mike uh, watched The Office. Yeah, he's been watching. He's been watching. He's been Office. watching. It sounds like he's almost done. And uh-huh. uh, I'd, 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 I'd asked him if he wanted to do a bonus episode when he finishes it to kind of talk about it. And he said he was game for it, but I, I haven't really talked to him about it that much. He's got a kid and a job and all that. Responsibilities. Responsibilities. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Totally. So we've got a lot of ground to cover in this uh, episode. So we're going to kind of just alternate. Uh, basically, as Tiny said, this is basically an extended potpourri. We're not going to spoil anything. If we do, we will do the. Um, we will basically warn you ahead of time. Yep. But we won't uh, spoil anything. And I'm, you know, basically stuck in a cycle now where I'm just keep talking. So I need to go and uh, just start <laughs> it. Okay. So I am. I had a long day at work. So anyway. Um, the, the, I'll go ahead and kick, get us kicked off. Do you mind, Tiny? Go for it. Okay, so, Tiny, you are a big fan of the documentary. Genre. I watch. I watch that genre like it's going out style. You do, and it is. And uh, no, it's not. It's, it's really not. <laughs> no. It's 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 you know it's a good genre and everything. We need to do another like episode about a specific because I really like doing like we did the uh, food documentaries episode. Uh-huh. Like I, I really want to do another one like that. So we'll have to figure that out. I love food and I love documentaries. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily need to be food documentaries. It could be like no, it would be does. fun to do like sports documentaries, like the Thirty for Thirties ones we've talked about. Yeah, or uh, other kinds of documentary. But I don't like sports. Like I like food. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyways, anyway, man. um, yes, um, or or uh, or we can definitely do one about uh, like just water documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> documentaries about water because that would be just fascinating i bet you i could find another documentary one. series about water. I, I, I haven't actually i haven't actually like gone back and edited that episode yet uh just kind of a peek behind the curtain <laughs> so i don't know how much of a dick i sounded in that episode <laughs> yet so if i did i apologize but mm. anyway so i watched a documentary and basically this was just a kind of a, a thing last night i was kind of bored or i wasn't necessarily bored it was just that i was forcing myself to make notes for antho- my, the latest episode of anthology my solo side project podcast and um so i wanted something playing in the background and usually i like throw on family guy or something uh which i may throw in in this topic too but um but then i kind of wanted something kind of new or something that was at least of interest to me. So I found a documentary that is on a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Mm-hmm. It's called Fart, a documentary. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a little hour and 11 minute long documentary on Amazon Prime that's all about f- farting and uh, its place in comedy and its history and the, the kind of social anxiety that comes along with farting and the social um, uh, context or the... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? The, the, the taboo of farting, essentially. Um, and I have to say, this was not that interesting. It just, I mean, it was a documentary about farting. <laughs> and you made fun of me for watching a documentary about water. <laughs> well, huh? yeah, yeah. At two, Matthew. <laughs> Technically, we just so we've got a, we've got a liquid and a gas. Now we just need to <laughs> talk better about solids. <laughs> oh my god, it's uh, so, funny. Thank you. Um, well, the water can be all three. Uh, that's true. So anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but no, fart. A documentary was just kind of just kind of okay. It was something I had playing in the background, and that's about uh, that's about what um. The level of interest it was for me that I think I would have if I engaged my full attention on it. I think I would have just thought it was just, eh, just kind of meh. Um, there was this one character or subject in the documentary. Um, he was called, 
I think it was like Scottish or, or British or something. Um, but his, his name was Mr. Methane. Um, or he might have been Irish. But anyway, um, he is basically this guy who performs for people <laughs> by farting. He's like in a superhero costume thing. Every time I saw like clips of it and clips of him, I just thought, okay, that's, that's, I don't get it. I just, I just didn't get it. <laughs> I just didn't understand what I was seeing. <laughs> Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't very good. It was just, I mean, it was, it was okay, but nothing really to write home about. Um, yeah. Eh. So is it on the flicks? It is on the Amazon, oh, okay. uh, Amazon prime. And, uh, yeah, it was not really much to write home about. Gotcha. Um, so that's fart, a documentary tiny. What, uh, what pray tell do you have to talk about? Uh, I pray tell that. What I have, uh, so the the main <laughs> thing I've been watching lately, obviously, is the Olympics. Oh yeah, right. The Olympics going on right now, very mm-hmm. exciting. I love the Olympics; it's fun. We're crushing it as nice. the United States. Uh, so that's been great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then since it's come up uh, more than a handful of times, mm-hmm. um, and it has to do with your other podcast anthology. My other uh, what is anthology? Uh, mm-hmm. Anthology is about ologies. No, ants. It's about ants, right? It's false. The, that's, the study of ants. That's false advertising. Anthology. Okay, that's not. It's, it's uh, not. It's not what it's. Anthology about. is my solo side project podcast exploring science fiction anthology storytelling during television's first golden age. Each episode, I take an episode of the Twilight Zone and discuss it as a first-time viewer, and end each episode with a bonus review of a movie or show related to the main topic. Nice. Uh, when do you so, plan to review American Idol? <sighs> how, how long do we have to wait for? <laughs> For th- that's have not, a bonus episode on from Justin to bonus. Kelly. That's not. That's I don't think you're. <laughs> that's the golden age you're talking about, right? Me serious at all? No, it's not. It's an I kid. Anthology. I kid. Anyway, uh, so you were I saying about kid. my solo side project podcast at anthologypod.com? Well, you have very vehemently been uh, uh, proselytizing about a an episode of television called "The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street." I have. Oh wow! I I hadn't noticed. <laughs> Huh. Yeah. I had knows I've been I've been uh talking so much about one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. Um uh, yeah. so you saw it? Is yeah. That... Interesting. I watched it. It's on the Flix. Nice. So uh it's also on Hulu and Amazon Prime. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh so so what did you think of uh one of the best episodes of television of all time? That you've ever seen. Um, that I've ever seen. <laughs> it was pretty good. Good. <laughs> pretty good. That's pretty good, yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it's about the things. Uh mm-hmm. stuff and things. <laughs> no, it was good. I mean it mm-hmm. Before I watched it, like I think I sent you, I texted you a picture of the screen as I was watching. You were like, "Oh, tell me what you think" and stuff like that. And then you <laughs> sure. were like, "You're like, I built it up too much, didn't I?" And I was like, "No, right." Well, I no. said, "I hope I didn't build it up too much." Yeah, you, and I mean, you, yeah, you did. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's fair. That's I mean, fair. Yeah, to be honest, yeah, it was mm-hmm. a little overbuilt. I think. Sure. Um, but it was good. I, mm-hmm. I really, what that that's part of this. This episode demonstrates what makes the Twilight Zone so incredible. Is it takes, <laughs> it melds two kinds of genres together, or it melds two ideas together. The idea of you know science fiction, uh, otherworldly travel, and it fuses it with like a psychological concept, mm-hmm. um, like like crowd think or um, crowd right. psychology stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, and it, it just puts it blends those two things together really beautifully, and that's that's what makes the Twilight Zone one of a kind a one of a kind show so i really respect it for that mm-hmm. um so were you just not that engaged with it i think i think the format really hurt it okay. because that's something that needs to be explored very thoroughly and they have 25 minutes to do it in mm-hmm. the twilight zone and i feel like the concept of like crowd psychology or mob think was condensed far too much into a 25 minute episode. Um, I feel like the characters in the show came to their conclusions way too quickly. Um, I, I feel like, I feel like the emergency they were thrust into in the episode was a little too, a little too, uh, it was basically just an inconvenience as opposed to mm-hmm. an emergency. And I just thought it was, I don't know, it, it, it was just, it was just too, too convenient or like too, uh, I just I didn't get a sense of emergency 
they jumped enough, to conclusions. They jumped to conclusions. Bit? I didn't okay. get enough of a sense of, of sense of an emergency that the characters would react the way they did, given the event that they're experiencing. And and you know that's that's pretty fair. I did not come to that at all. For for listeners who haven't seen it, despite my nagging, <laughs> uh, the the episode is is episode twenty two of the first season of the Twilight Zone. Um, it's about a a neighborhood that experiences what they believe is um they 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 witness a strange light that hovers over their street and then disappears. They think it's a meteorite, and then suddenly all of their electronics. Or just goes out their powers out their cars won't start their telephones are out everything is just dead and so then they basically the group of the neighborhood gets together and they're trying to figure out what's going on and it quickly descends into this really really intense um paranoia based group think mob mentality kind of storyline and tell you what uh, uh, uh my from my well Okay, so so if you contextualize this episode to 1959, or I think it aired in 1960, but that era, like this is the height of the Cold War, everyone's afraid of, you know, nuclear winter and everything, and it's also, it's also a statement about um, McCarthyism and the blacklist, which is something that Serling witnessed and saw a lot of his friends lose their jobs or lose their lives even um, because they couldn't work and they ended up committing suicide due to being blacklisted um, just because people named names just to def- just to uh, defer um, or, or um, to cast uh, cast dispersions on someone else just so that the limelight would go or the he would be off of them and so in that in I'm not saying that if you view it in that context it makes it the greatest thing ever I'm just saying that in in general terms like if you view the episode as this allegory for human nature and how humans, when they're backed into a corner, and I understand that you're saying that it's, it's a, it's a strange situation that they jump to conclusions to, but it's also like they, they're noticing that their electronics aren't working and then something happens to kind of catapult them into, um, let's see, let, I'm trying to, trying to phrase it without like spoiling it or anything, but mm-hmm. something happens to make them, question the intentions of another person and what i love about this episode and i've talked about it at length in episode 20 or uh, episode 17 of anthology so check it out there for more of me blathering on about it but um just to kind of wrap up um something happens to make them suspect another person but what i love about it is before that a child basically just warns them that oh i've read in science fiction these things um, this is a trope in science, or this is something I read in science fiction. And what I love is that it's not in explicitly stated that that's what they're like. It's not like they just go with it because that's what he said. It's just, it's just the situation itself is so bizarre that it just becomes a point of fact for them that maybe this is what's going on because they don't know. And it's all kind of an allegory to, for, you know, cold war and, and McCarthyism and the blacklist and a bunch of other things like that. And that's what connected with me about it was that even if it is just, even if it was written in the context of the, the fifties and sixties and, and like all that stuff I stated before, you can also see patterns in human nature and human history. Like go back to the Salem witch trials and go back to like even sadly, even present day. Um, and even like post nine 11, like xenophobia and, and, um, and, and, uh, uh, paranoia paranoia and everything yeah. like these are kind of cyclical um thought processes and that's what's incredibly damaging to us as a, a, a species um and i think that that's something that was encapsulated so well in that episode and that's why i loved it yeah and, and i will completely concede that it's mm-hmm. it is very good allegory or, mm-hmm. or satire uh i i completely agree with that that's and I picked up on that too, you know, like, right? Being that it was, in, I knew it was like late fifties or early sixties, so yeah, right. it's not like a subtle thing either. Like, yeah, it's, exactly. It's pretty clear, yeah. right? Right. It's it's <clears throat> it's Doctor Strange love. Um, it's very <laughs> right. It hits you over the head with it, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but in but in a great way, and I'm, like I've said, like I said, it's good. It's mm-hmm. good. Um, it's it's a really great great piece of television. I'm not. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I'm glad you liked it. Right, <laughs> it's just not one of the best episodes you've ever seen. I don't, I don't think so. That's I mean, fine, but it's it's it is very good, and I think mm-hmm. I think you can explore that. 
I think it would be easier to explore, like I said, that concept with a lot more time. Mm-hmm. Like I know there was a movie that came out uh, with Michael Shannon and Take what's Shelter? her name? No, it's no. called Bug. And it was originally oh, a play. Really? And it's about these two people who kind of hole up in a, uh, they hole up in a, um, hotel room. Okay. And they basically never leave. And the guy is like, uh, played by Michael Shannon is, um, uh, crazy essentially. And he basically okay. convinces, convinces this girl, this woman who's with him. It's actually Judd, I think, mm-hmm. um, that like there are bugs infesting the room. When really there's nothing, and it's huh. it's completely he completely plays on her psychology, and mm-hmm. he uses psychological uh, ideas and concepts in order to convince her of this, and they and it, it's it has a very incredible ending. Um, the movie wasn't that popular, wasn't that well received, I don't think, but mm-hmm. I think that's a good exploration of uh, that's a more thorough explana- ex- exploration of that concept and that's fair and i, I mean th- i think they did a good job with what they the 25 minutes they had I right mean, that's, that, like i said I think, i'm surprised they were able to even do it mm-hmm. um but yeah I, I don't know i just serling's closing narration is just like that it's just such a beautiful piece yeah. of writing to oh, sum yeah. up his point and everything Agre- i agree with that yeah. yeah definitely um yeah and and to each their own and like i said you can um <clears throat> Listen to my more thorough thoughts on it on episode 17 of Anthology. And uh, they remade it in 2003 in uh, in the revival that was in the 2000s of The Twilight Zone. Oh. Which, yeah, and uh, Tiny, it's not good. Don't. It's, oh, really? Yeah, it's it's available in its entirety on YouTube. And what and we can we'll move on really quickly after this but um i also reviewed it on anthology in episode 17 but what it is is it updates it to be a post 911 story which mm. in theory is a really good a really good st- good idea um to showcase how insane it is for the paranoia of that but it is just a complete disaster lacks all all subtlety like i will just say from the opening scene there's like a neighborhood like group meeting and Titus Welliver from Bosch. And um, I may have said this on a past episode of the podcast. Now they say this out loud, but um, Bosch and, and lost, he is kind of a um, kind of a macho kind of um, uh, um, authoritative presence. Okay. But his, uh, so th- so this is a meeting in the middle of the day. He is sitting on a couch. He's drinking a beer He's wearing his high school letter jacket. Oh, boy. And he's talking about how he wants to go home and watch some football. And it is like the most cliched <laughs> characterization I've ever seen. And it's ridiculous. Wow. And the whole episode is not, um, doesn't get much better than that. But anyway, yeah, like I said, anthology, um, episode 17. But Tiny, this conversation made me really excited to, uh, to talk to you about the time element, which I think we're still planning to do. I'm going to have you on anthology as a bonus episode at the end of the season. Okay. So, yeah, I'm excited for it. All right. And I can tell how excited you are for it. I can't wait. Yeah. It's good to be the boss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so, yeah, that's enough about that. Uh, it's a shame that you didn't like it. Are you, are you watching The Twilight Zone along with it? I did, I did not like it. Right. Well, I, I mean, it. okay, yeah, yeah, I, I misspoke. It's I a shame I that you hated it. During it. And you, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't know what to say to that. Um, <laughs> But uh, are, are you watching the Twilight Zone? Just I'm I'm more? I'm working my way through it. I, I'm gotcha. only like eight episodes in. Okay, cool. Not that much. Cool. Well, uh, hopefully something in it will, uh, you know, connect with you more. Mm-hmm. Um. So anyway, uh, speaking of things that we didn't really connect with that much. Um. So tiny. I watched season one of Mr. Robot. Nice. Yes, which is on Amazon Prime right now, and Mr. Robot is a show. Starring, um, oh wow, I can't, uh, Rami Malik. Rami Malik, uh, from the Pacific. And, uh, also Christian Slater. <laughs> I was, nice job, Sledgehammer. I was wondering if you were going to do it. But, <laughs> yeah, anyway. I was thinking about it. <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, R- Rami, M- Rami, oh, crap. I don't know. I think, I think it's Rami Malik. Rami, okay. Yeah, uh, Rami think. Malik, sure. Uh, and Christian Slater. It's about a hacker who, um, works for a, um, God, a uh, uh, cyber security firm, essentially. Okay. And uh, he's basically recruited by 
what is essentially anonymous, but in this show it's it's called F Society, um, to hack into this <laughs> this major corporation um, that is just evil. Um, so much so that it's called E Corp, but uh, throughout, God. right. <laughs> and uh, what's what's kind of interesting about the show is that it is it's it's interesting in that like uh, Rami Malek he. Uh, kind of narrates it through his perspective so like he'll say something like like the introduction to e-corp is saying like yeah they have everything and they do all this stuff and um they're just they're proliferating evil throughout all of the society and they might as well be called evil corp or the e might as well be stand for evil and then throughout the entire like rest of the season and series uh that's just what they're referred to <laughs> like, that's funny like the characters like it's just it's weird. It's it's funny. It's just like Evil Corp, and it's like it's so weird to to have them say this, uh, just like with straight faces, because it's just in in so many terms, it's basically from his perspective. Everyone is saying Evil Corp, but that's that's kind of minima, minimizing the entire thing. I didn't really care for the first season. I it didn't really connect with me that much. It's got a lot of lot of high praise, um, ton of high praise actually, and um. And I don't know. It just didn't work for me. There were some interesting things about it plot wise that had I been more invested in it, it would have been more, um, it would have been more, uh, I don't want to say profound. It would have been, it would have been, it would have stuck with me more. There are major events in it that, um, kind of pack a narrative punch that if I was more engaged with it i would be like oh i'm right along with it so this is incredible but since i wasn't that engaged with it as a story um it was just like oh oh okay i yeah kind of kind of guess that or or oh that happened okay fine um so i was kind of disengaged with all of it and then there were a couple other things that I, i just had a problem with like like little nitpicking things but like in one of the episodes the entire episode is about um, uh, Rami, Rami, Malco, uh, Malik's, uh, character, um, being forced to do something with his hacker skills, um, that results in something big. That's vague enough, but it's, it's absurd. Um, just in general, it's just an absurd action that is taken, that is done. And it's even more absurd that the, like, it's completely inconsequential to the rest of the season. Um, and it's just like, it's this, it's like, this is a major, major thing. And then it's not referenced at all for through the rest of the season. I think it happens in like episode four and it's a 10 episode season. And then it's just like, Oh, all right. We, we, uh, killed enough time there. So let's get, move on to this. And then there's, and I've been thinking about this. There is kind of a central villain, um, or, or antagonist character. He's like the CFO or prospective CFO of evil corp. And, He's, I've I've been struggling with this, with my thoughts on this character, because I want to say that it seems just so derivative of the types of villainous characters that I've seen, but I can't necessarily pick out any specific examples, but he's basically this sociopathic um, character who does things on impulse, or not necessarily on impulse, but he's a very calculating character person who's trying to be manipulative and, and get his way to the top. And, um, on one respect, it's, it's interesting because he's failing miserably <laughs> throughout, uh, several times throughout the season, but he does these things that don't really make sense to me as to why he does these things. Like he does, a, he does like one major thing that I immediately thought like, Holy crap, that's, that's big. That's crazy. Um, and then again, it just kind of gets, flush by the wayside it kind of kind of doesn't really have much going on with it um it's not a big through line through the season it's it's just kind of bizarre the whole the whole show is kind of bizarre to me and i don't know i just didn't connect with it um there were a couple other things one is the framing of of the show i i don't get like like it's weird like it's not like like okay if i was if i were shooting you tiny with a camera you'd be sent center of the frame and everything but this is like the the heads in each frame are like there. They always occupy like the left or right corner of the screen. And it's just, it's a really weird choice. And I don't, I just don't, I I'll admit, I just flat out don't get it. Huh. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's been really, 
uh, had a lot of praise because it's it's like a real it's like a realistic um portrayal of hacking and and coding and stuff and i think i heard somewhere that everything that they actually ha- like every every scene that involves hacking they actually have to code like do put in like like they actually have to code the things in to make it to make it so they're actually doing things that are like authentic hacking things and i'm just like that's cool. I I still I mean that doesn't make an engaging story for me. Yeah. Um it sounds yeah. like that's what's that's what's drawing in a niche crowd that mm-hmm. likes it. Yeah, and it, yeah, and it, and it's really popular. Like I I think you say niche crowd, but it is it is a very popular show from my perspective. Oh, really? So, okay. Yeah, and I mean that and that's great for it and everything. I just don't get it. Also the um uh, uh, the guy who created it, I want to say it's Sam Esmail. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, he also made a movie called Comet that I saw on Netflix a while ago. Did you ever see that tiny with Justin Long? I did not, but I remember you talking about it. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't too crazy about that either. Cause it, cause it, I don't even really remember. It, it was kind of a weird, strange, strange movie that was kind of almost there for me, but just didn't really work out for me in the long run. So I don't know. I just don't, I just think I, I I just don't think I get this guy. Okay. Um, the show's same. on uh, USA, isn't it? It is, yes. And it also features, uh, I don't know if you pronounce it Michael or Michelle, but uh, the guy who played, uh, it's Michael Gill, essentially. Uh, he played the president in seasons one and two of House of Cards. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember Tiny, do you remember specifically in our season, I think, two review of House of Cards? I think it was seasons one and two. But... um. Do you remember how you said that he? I remember specifically you said that he's just kind of a nothing character. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, watching watching Mr. Robot just made me think like hmm, maybe it's also his acting because <laughs> like he's I mean he's not really given that much to work with. He's somewhat of a pseudo mentor to uh, Elliot is is the main character's name. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also like he's not. He's just kind of the same. It, it's like what if what if the president in House of Cards was a gay man who is in charge of a uh, tech security company? So that's hmm. yeah, I don't know. So I didn't I didn't really care for it that much. Um, if you liked it, let me know. Check out the Facebook group and let me know how <laughs> wrong I am. Um, and uh, I I don't think I'll be watching season two. It's currently airing now. I don't, I don't think I'm gonna. And I think Craig Robinson's in it too. Oh, okay. In season two, so I don't think I don't think I'm gonna pick it back up. But okay. Yep. To each their own. That's a shame. That seems like a cool topic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you might like it. I mean, yeah. I recommend checking it out cool. if you you're into that kind of thing. Awesome. Yep. So next up for me, uh, I know you're all just shocked, but it's a documentary. Is it a fart <laughs> documentary? It is not about. Uh, the gas. Oh, okay. Um, this is on is on the Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a movie called Welcome to Leith. Um, Leith is a city in North Dakota okay. with a population of twenty six. That includes adults and children. Wow. So 26? apparently, this this was news to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, throughout, I don't know if it's just North Dakota or maybe some other states it's very common for there to be it was common for these in, incredibly small communities to basically just become a city and you know in a city you have a mayor and you elect your mayor right huh. and it it just became a common thing because um of you know a state like North Dakota isn't exactly rich in like you know right. uh, public services um for example the county that this city is in uh has a sheriff's department with three deputies and a sheriff huh so i mean imagine you know the county that you live in being the the, the rule of law enforced by four men it's you wow. know that's incredibly difficult that's not mm-hmm. that's hard to enforce it's hard it's hard to take care of that and there just aren't a lot of resources in this area so these communities basically a group of houses together became a city and they elect their own mayor and they have their own government and they make their own decisions about how things should go. Um, and this documentary follows a story or an event that happened in Leith where a man seeming just an unassuming man moved, bought property in Leith mm-hmm. and moved in and he attempted to buy 
more property in the city of Leith. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that this man is one, this man is one of the most famous and well-respected uh, white supremacists in the world. Oh, wow. And his plan was to purchase land and build dwellings huh. and bring his like-minded individuals to come live in this city and have them vote for him as mayor. And he would essentially take over this city in a way. Wow. Yeah, and you could basically just make your own little haven for white supremacy. Um, it's It's actually... It's disturbing, of course, but it's a really brilliant idea when you, when you think about it. It really is. I mean, if you know, if you're trying to, it what what amazed me about this is how tenuous mm -hmm. democracy is. Mm -hmm. Because what this guy was attempting to do, he was attempting to use the democratic process, which in the United States we hold so hold so dearly, and you know, mm -hmm. it's it's shaped us as a nation and as a society it's been integral to that and we see it as this very we we have it on a pedestal really i mean we see it as this like the the, the perfect form of government or maybe not perfect but it is the best form of government out of all the governments that have ever been tried throughout the history of human society and mm -hmm. so to see it used in such a way really just screwed with my mind because i was like oh my god this guy com through completely legal processes was planning to essentially take over the city mm -hmm. um and it, it it's what i loved about the documentary is that we didn't get a bunch of talking heads talking about it after it happened okay the camera showed up while this guy was trying to buy this land and, oh nice and uh the townspeople found out and felt threatened and um of the 26, it may be 28, but I think I'm, I'm almost positive it was under 30 people. Uh, of the those people, there was one black guy who lived there. Oh, wow. And so, ironically, his house was really close to, well, of course, the houses are all really close because it's 26 people. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, it's like, how do we, what's going to happen to this guy, you know, <laughs> if, if this, if, if this man actually, attains his goal you know yeah. it's like what happens to that guy is he does he have to move i mean it's like God. it's it was just a really fascinating process to watch um at, at at one point the local government gets together um and they vote that like all all dwellings that are being lived in for more than a certain amount of time have to have electricity and running water and plumbing mm -hmm. because the two properties that this guy had bought did not have running water. Oh, okay. So, I mean, they, they tried to use, uh, incidentally, they tried to use the democracy ag against him, right. uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's, it's just really fascinating how it all worked out. I don't, I don't want to spoil it. Mm -hmm. um, but you, I mean, you can Google the guy who, the guy who's the main subject of the, of the documentary. He's an incredibly disturbing man. He's, he just has, he just very, he's a scary guy. Mm -hmm. Um, He's tried to do this like three other times. Jeez. Yeah, and it's like he's almost succeeded a few times. Um, and it's 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 an unfortunate look at at how how entrenched these ideas are. Um, you know, you, the most dangerous thing in the world is an idea because it can never be defeated. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, white supremacy is 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 alive and well. Um, and and after part of the documentary covers how after nine eleven. Um, uh, groups like the Southern Poverty, oh gosh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Sorry, that took me forever. Um, <laughs> the Southern Poverty Law Center and anti-terrorist groups and you know anti-terror departments within the government. Um, after nine eleven, they switched so much of their focus over to uh, Islamic extremism. Okay, and so groups like uh, wh white supremacy groups have really grown and and you know, become a lot more successful as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, that's scary and, and disturbing how we think of that as an antiquated, uh, a very outdated and very ignorant idea and concept. Like only, only stupid hillbillies out in the middle of nowhere believe that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it turns out there are hundreds of thousands of them out, out in the United States and they're, wow. they're in your cities and they're in your towns. And it's scary to think about, but, like I said, the most impressive thing about, or the not impressive, but the most, uh, the scariest thing, or the thing that I concentrated on the most uh, during this documentary is that this guy was legally going to take over the city, and, and he mm -hmm. was doing it through legal processes, and he was using democracy against itself. It was really just an incredible thing to watch. 
That uh, genuinely sounds really interesting. He yeah. Sounds like a supervillain. I mean, yeah, he, <laughs> he kind of is. Yeah. Uh, and well, it was it was also sad because one of his best best friends or guy he worked with a lot was a guy from Indiana. Oh, really? Who's very also very famous in the white supremacy world. Oh, that's he has shame. he has a group with thousands of members in Indiana, and it's just like, oh, man, Indiana sucks sometimes. It does. It does. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and uh, potentially alienate some listeners. But if you're a part of that group and you're listening to this, I don't, I don't agree. Agreed. Um, but yeah, uh, that's a shame. That's on the Netflix. It's called Welcome to Leith. Leith, yes, L E I T H okay. is the name of the city. Gotcha. I may have to check that out. Um, really interesting. Yep. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's a tough act to follow, Tiny. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> Please lighten the mood a little. Okay. <laughs> so I recently saw a movie called The Secret Life of Pets. Aw. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So The Secret Life of Pets is the late. Ah, I can't remember the. Um, I can't remember the production company. The guys that did Minions. Um, I think it's Illuminate. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I may be wrong. But anyway, um, per the IMDb synopsis on IMDb. Jesus, um, for <laughs> The Secret Life of Pets. Uh, IMDb says, The quiet life of a terrier named Max is upended when his owner takes in Duke, a stray whom Max instantly dislikes. And, uh, you know, a lot of this movie, some, or I should say, some of this movie worked with me quite a bit. Um, the idea of Max, voiced by Louis C.K., um, being kind of ter- uh, territorial over his over his home when his when his uh human brings home another dog i liked that aspect i kind of wish or it, it explores it quite a bit but then the movie kind of gets into this whole thing about um stray animals and and animal like they call them uh fl- um flushed pets um pets that were kind of uh given away or 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 they weren't wanted as pets so they were just kind of let go and there's kind of this whole underground society that's kind of like this little gang um that gets involved with the story and i thought that it was kind of cluttered um it's it's hard to say there i mean there are some things about this movie that really worked for me um and then other things that just didn't um Hmm. yeah uh, i figured this would be right up your alley because you love anthropomorphized dogs i absolutely love anthropomorphized oh my god (laughs) anthropomorphized animals now that i have a cat uh-huh. um <laughs> no but like like i mean you know me well i've, yeah. I've spent a majority of my life um anthropomorphizing my pets throughout my life yep um so, and that's not an exaggeration <laughs> i am single ladies but anyway um <laughs> so so i i was really excited for this and i was really i was really looking forward to it but it, it was kind of cluttered there was a lot about the movie that just didn't really work for me like um the character of Duke, voiced by Eric Stone Street, he is this new the the new pet that is brought into the house. Um, there is this whole subplot where he is uh, he reveals why he was in the pound when when the human got him, and I I'm I'm nah, this isn't a spoiler, but when he reveals it. It doesn't. It doesn't go anywhere meaningful that I would want it to be. It's. It's a major plot development that I felt really should have been explored more throughout the movie instead of having these um, kind of wacky antics of of these uh, kind of actually pretty dark antics of this gang of of animals chasing after our protagonist. I, I thought that if they would have refined the story a little bit and focus more on that, because it's kind of just a complete throwaway thing. Um, it, when it comes down to it, it it's kind of, it comes up out of nowhere and then it leaves just as much and it just, it didn't work for me. And, um, and I'm being, I'm being pretty negative on it and I don't really mean to be that negative on it cause it, it's a, it's a cute movie. Um, and a lot of the stuff did work for me. I liked the, I liked Max, the, the character of Max. I, I thought that he was a strong protagonist. I like some of the stuff that happened to and around him, but, um, overall I just thought that it was just kind of a, kind of a letdown it, it was just kind of wasn't really my cup of tea um unfortunately that's a shame it really is it really is like like there are moments that could have been like pixar level emotional resonance that 
just did not land that way. Bummer. Yeah, it it really was. Um, also, I mean, the whole minions thing. I don't. I'm not a big. Yeah, I'm not into that really. Yeah, I. It's. I just. I just don't get it. Um, yeah. I haven't seen minions, but I have seen Despicable Me, and I'm like, okay, they're they're minions. Okay. Yeah. Um, having said that, the the short that was played before the movie was actually pretty enjoyable. It was minions based, but it was just also like, okay, that's. That's enough minions for me. The minions are um, being minions. Right, exactly. Yeah, they're not specifically diverse. Right. Yeah, which is so, kind of the point, I guess, but still. Right. right. Whatever. Yeah. So, and then and there are references to minions in Secret Life of Pets, like a little bit here and there, but... Okay. Anyway, yeah, so that's Secret Life of Pets. I I wasn't mad that I saw it or anything. Like, it, it I didn't hate it, but it there were a lot of issues with it that uh, didn't work for me. Also, real quick, I have no idea why... Um, Ellie Kemper was cast in the movie. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, she plays the main character's like like human owner, and uh, she has a recognizable voice. And I was excited to hear her voice because I really like her. Um, and she, like, throughout the whole movie, she has maybe four lines. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, why get Ellie Kemper for that? When it, I mean, it's it's like there's nothing like it's like. 20 minutes and here's your paycheck. Hmm. Like it, it's, it's got like four or five lines tops. Jeez. So it was, it, that was kind of just bizarre. Yeah. But yeah. So anyway, okay. Um, that's secret life of pets. And, uh, what do you have for us next tiny? Well, I have a, uh, a totally, uh, fresh, uh, you know, fiction movie that I, it's another documentary. Uh, um, is it yeah, about farting? I figured I'd get, Get those out of the way early. Oh, good. Because uh, I know I'm. I'm sure our listeners are sick of me talking about them, but they're good, guys. That's Documentaries good. are good. Well, and the the thing before we get to what it is and everything, the thing that I like about it or that I like about documentaries is a lot of diversity. Like you just talked about one that's kind of depressing about, you know, the dark side of yeah. of the political thing. So I mean, you're kind of due for a really positive, upbeat documentary. Yeah. So what what is this one? Uh, it's called Poverty Inc. <laughs> <laughs> or Poverty Incorporated, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It it actually is a little more positive than the title would imply. Okay. Um one of the the, the main uh thesis of this documentary is that the concept of uh international aid is very flawed. Okay. And it's it's an exercise in uh paternalism and when you're paternalistic you're essentially the people you're trying to help you you basically keep them as like uh you keep them locked into a certain lifestyle and it it ends up being a negative influence um the it's it's something i never really thought about you know you think that you donate 20 bucks to the Red Cross and a group of kids gets something to eat mm-hmm. in a third world country somewhere. Um, that That's what we all think and it makes us feel good. Um, but at the end of the day, the problem is if 100,000 of us do that, those kids grow up relying on uh relying on aid and they don't know how to do things for themselves and huh. there's no a lot of these countries like Haiti after the uh after the earthquake mm-hmm. and uh a lot of the african nations that have been completely destroyed by war and genocide and things like that um they have no infrastructure and huh. they have no economy because it's entirely based on people giving them things so people don't have jobs people don't have they don't have anything until someone gives it to them and mm-hmm. and they've they've developed with a concept that that's how it works and that's how their quote unquote economy is going to run is that people just give them things um it's it's it, it kind of plays on the old adage uh if you give a man a fish he eats for a day if you teach a man to fish he eats for a lifetime mm-hmm. it kind of plays on that um you know it kind of it was kind of negative it, it kind of took a negative light of the company uh toms they make tom shoes oh yeah um part of that company is for every pair of shoes that you buy 
he donates another pair to someone in Africa or South America or again a third world third world country. Um, and you know, on the on the surface, when you look at it, you're like, wow, that's really great. That's cool that he does that and gives those kids clothing. Mm-hmm. But what happens to the local cobbler, the local shoe right. store? It's like. No one's going to go pay $10 for a pair of shoes mm-hmm. or get their shoes fixed because Tom's going to give them a free pair. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just it's it's very interesting how the concept of paternalism in the long term has a very negative effect. Uh the the microcosm of Haiti was very interesting to look at because after that earthquake, Haiti was absolutely devastated, but the amount of foreign aid they had in that country was just unbelievable. And they talked to a lot of Haitians and people who live there. And, you know, they said, you know, when that happened, we needed that aid. We needed food. We needed shelter. We needed clean water. We needed workers. We needed people who could help us clean up. We needed all that. But now we're back on our feet, but people are still here. uh, I think Haiti is like the number one place in the world for, uh, non-government organizations like mm-hmm. the Red Cross and, and stuff like that. Wow. Um, and there was, there was a, uh, agricultural economy in Haiti before the earthquake, but now these NGOs, if you will, uh, are flooding their economy with free rice. And so people used to eat rice once or twice a week, but now they eat it three times a day because mm-hmm. it's free. No one's going to go out and buy whatever because they can get rice for free. And it's right. it's just it's this cyclical concept that that happens with with foreign aid. And it's it was just it was really fasc- fascinating to watch these citizens of third world nations like Haiti and Rwanda and Sudan say that they want people to stop giving them free stuff. <laughs> it's it was really fascinating. It's uh, wow. it's. And and it's not it's not exactly like political or anything. It's just like you know we love Bono and we love the Red Cross, <laughs> but uh, you could be helping us in other ways. You know, there, there's there's a much better way you could be helping us and invest in us. Don't give us stuff. Kind mm-hmm. of is is kind of the message. Um, you really just need to see it. It's it's really good. It's on the Netflix. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend it. And it's called Poverty Inc. Poverty Inc. And you heard it here. You heard it here, guys. You the did. official stance of the obsessive viewer is stop donating things. Yes. Stop <laughs> just, just stop. There is a donate button on <laughs> obsessiveviewer.com. Also, we'll, t- we'll take all the foreign aid we can get. Right, exactly. Yeah, yes. I love rice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, that. Anyway, um, <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting, Tiny, and that's uh, just looking. Okay, that is the last documentary. That is the last documentary. I promise. Cool, neat. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Um, okay, so next up for me is okay. I I saw Jason Bourne, yeah. and you know, I I went in with with fairly low expectations um ordinarily when i go into a to a movie that's part of a franchise such as jason Bourne or any marvel movie or well not necessarily marvel movie but anytime i go into a movie that is a part of a franchise i really try to make an effort to rewatch the movies in the lead up to it however with the Bourne franchise this is i mean i i really really like the Bourne identity that is a really great um spy action movie um from by my taste um supremacy and ultimatum i was just kind of i thought they were just pretty okay i thought that they were pretty good not nothing i i don't revisit them that much and then uh born legacy was just that was just a plotless mess from my count yeah and i haven't uh <laughs> and it seems like jason born the movie has uh, just completely forgotten that happened. Nice. That's good. Um, yeah. So Jason Bourne basically picks up with Matt Damon's character, um, and things happen. It's essentially if you see the honest trailers for the Bourne franchise, things happen. I'd hope so. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, the the honest trailers for the Bourne franchise are fantastic because they basically point out how every movie is about a group of government people. Um, staring at screens in a secluded location, chasing after Matt Damon. <laughs> yeah, and that's I mean that's it's more the same. Um, kind of the big thing about this movie though is that 
Jason Bourne remembers everything and he's finding information or he's trying to find information about certain things in his past. And throughout the whole movie, I'm like, okay, they're, they are giving us some good information. They're giving us some good backstory that we haven't gotten yet. And this is all stuff that we, um, as followers of this character through multiple movies, this is all information that, that is really important to the growth of the character and to rounding out the full character. And it's, it's kind of like, it kind of feels like, okay, cool. Yeah. We're getting a full picture of this character who is by definition, a a shrouded in mystery kind of character. Um, unfortunately throughout the whole movie, I was just thinking, okay, I just don't care. I'm just not again. And maybe this is on me because this is the same thing I said about, uh, Mr. Robot and, um, I'm really down on pretty much You're everything. Negative Nancy. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot that I had that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm super down and I don't mean to be. It's just Jason Bourne. I will say this. Jason Bourne had some decent action in it. Um, there in particular, there's a really cool car chase sequence through, uh, the Vegas strip, which was pretty cool. Um, but I mean, it's just, not much there for me to latch on to again. Maybe I'm in a funk. I, I honestly, maybe I'm in a funk. I don't think I am, but maybe I am. Um, because it's just, it was just, it was just hard for me to find anything to really root for in this movie. And by the end of it, it was just like, okay, they're playing that song again over the credits. <laughs> I don't, okay. Like it's interesting to me that they changed up. The most interesting thing about this entry in the Bourne franchise is that they, didn't name it the born something. They just named it Jason Bourne. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of harsh and everything, but for the most part, it just, it didn't do much for me. I don't know. Um, and looking at the rest of my, uh, stuff here, it's, uh, it's not going to get that much better. Oh man. Yeah. Bummer. Yeah. But anyway, I love the original trilogy. I like all three of them. Oh yeah. A lot. Like nice. I, I, I used to watch them regularly and mm-hmm. like when I finish one of the movies, it's like, I want to go do some push ups and go to the shooting range. <laughs> like it's, it's that kind of nice. action. Like it has that effect on me. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the original trilogy mm-hmm. and I wasn't overly excited for this movie. Um, yeah. just cause I feel like they put a button on it. It's mm-hmm. over. You know, it's, I don't, it's kind of like you don't need all the answers. You mm-hmm. don't need to know everything about a character or a story or whatever. And sometimes when you get those answers and the missing pieces of a story, it's just not satisfying. Right. Um, it's, it's happened many times and many things that I've watched and I, I was more than satisfied with the mystery left in the mm-hmm. born trilogy, the born franchise. I was fine with, I, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I mm-hmm. wanted to think about how he got started and where he was going and I'm fine playing those things out in my mind. I don't need more movies. Yeah. Yeah. This, and this one isn't, uh, going to do much for you. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always thought he was a bit of a Streisand, but he's rocked the shit in the original trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. Yeah. I love it. Matt Damon. Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. That's just as, as a brief tangent. Um, Matt Damon, like a month or two ago, did a, uh, or might have been less than a month ago, but he did a Ask Me Anything on Reddit. Yeah. And he, <laughs> uh, there was something, like, I don't remember exactly what, it was, but someone asked him, um, what he thought of his, of the portrayal of Matt Damon in Team America. And so he had this lengthy answer, a lengthy response <laughs> that was just like, you know, Matt, Matt and Trey are really genius guys and, and he didn't really understand it, but, but he thought it was really funny and it was very, very well said everything, but he hammered home that Matt and Trey are really genius storytellers and everything. And he said, like, he, my point is he said the word genius in regards to them, which they are geniuses. But what was really funny was that in like someone responded to it with uh, saying that actually, according to the trivia, um, Matt, Matt, uh, Matt Parker and Trey Stone wanted to make a character, make, make a more like a straightforward Matt Damon character. But then they saw the puppet and it quote, looked retarded. <laughs> um, so they decided to go with that. And what I loved is that another user, not Matt Damon, not anyone that was involved in the thread, just responded to that and just put genius. <laughs> it's like, that's, yeah. It really is. <laughs> I mean, we're still talking about it. That movie came out like 10 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's great. So, so funny. 
But but yeah, so um so so what's your next one, Tiny? Uh my next one is a really crappy movie called Mordecai. God, uh, we're just yeah going crazy here documentaries and crappy tv or crappy movies and one yeah. brilliant tv show episode I hate to i hate to ham it up but right. uh yeah this movie was just so bad mm-hmm. um when i saw the trailer i thought it was maybe going to be kind of funny okay um you know johnny depp can like play with that line of ridiculousness versus like just crazy enough to be hilarious mm-hmm. he knows how to toe that line uh and then other times he just just completely shits the bed. Sure. Um, this is one of the times that he completely shits the bed. Uh. Um, yeah, and, and you know, it's not all on him. There's uh, really terrible writing and just kind of a dumb idea for a movie in the first place. Um, he plays like the lineage of a very famous or like a very rich, wealthy, old English family, the Mort- Mordecai family. Okay. And uh, he's losing his fortune and he kind of uses his knowledge of art and like rare art to like buy buy a piece of art for cheap and upsell it to someone else and make money that way you know? okay yeah ewan mcgregor plays his friend from college who's a inspector detective inspector mm-hmm. and someone steals a painting and he uses mordecai to help him figure it out that's the premise of the movie pretty dumb and just not you know <laughs> you need to have something in there that makes it quirky and different or whatever mm-hmm. uh and they just they just didn't have it in this movie um Dang. Th- there there were concepts that were or tropes that were used throughout the movie that conceptually are funny and and they're good ideas uh for example um um god why can't i think of paul bettany mm-hmm. paul bettany plays johnny depp's like uh bodyguard and like servant okay um his, his right hand guy throughout the entire movie and um it's funny because even though he's his bodyguard johnny depp ends up hurting him all the time okay like when he's trying when when paul benny's trying to protect him johnny depp ends up like accidentally shooting him okay or hitting him over the head with something that's a funny idea mm-hmm. and done the right way that can be really funny just it just wasn't i i don't know what they needed to do differently to make it funny wow it just was not uh, also paul bettany's character he's like this very scarred and not very but like kind of scarred and disfigured man mm-hmm. and he has this very raspy gross voice and he's just very unappealing mm-hmm. but he just like gets laid like millions of times throughout the movie <laughs> and he's just like this like really he just he just knows how to get women throughout the movie and so again, that's a really funny idea that this disgusting guy hooks up with a bunch of hot chicks. That's funny. Uh, and I laughed at it maybe a couple times, but like, my sides did not hurt at the end of this movie. I'll put it that way. It, uh, it, most of the comedy just fell flat. Um, that's too bad. One of the best jokes in the movie, uh, was in the trailer. And it was the joke that made me kind of want to see the movie. Um, and it, that was the funniest part of the movie. What was the joke? Uh, it's like where he's checking it. Mordecai, Johnny Depp is checking into a hotel and the guy is like, do you want me to have someone take your bags? And Johnny Depp like looks at him like really offended, like take my bags. No, I have a bloody manservant who will take him upstairs. It's just kind of funny. Like he's oh, offended. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I thought it was funny in the trailer. Sure. Uh, yeah. And it was funny in the movie, but like that's, that was the funniest joke. That's too bad. Yeah. It, it's, it was just terrible. Huh. Do not see it. That I, I won't. Um, <laughs> yeah yeah that yeah that it didn't look that good and uh i really 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 hate to do this but the next thing i'm bringing up wasn't all that great either mm. um we did not plan this this is such a shame yeah so i recently saw lights out the are you familiar with the tiny i am yeah it yes. does not appeal to me okay yes so it is lights out is a horror movie um that recently came out where it's basically this entity lives in the darkness and uh can't can't enter into the light so anytime the lights are out um she is attacking people and this is based on like a three minute short film and i haven't seen the three minute short film but the movie is um you know i'll try to spin it into more of a positive (laughs) I've seen the short. The short's awesome. Is it? Okay. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out because in concept, this, this movie was, was good. I, I like the concept of it. However, and, and, uh, 
our friends over at the Nerds You're Looking For podcast, they they talked about it in one of the recent episodes, and I I agree with a lot of what they said. It um spends a lot of time explaining what's going on and what what the issue is with the entity, entity and the origin and and what what the cause of it is and everything, which is it's fine. Yeah, that's that's good that they're giving information, but they're not doing it in a very interesting way. Mm-hmm. Um, I did like that the main character. Well, okay, so the main character is played by Teresa Palmer. And she is good in kind of somewhat subverting the, you know, final girl trope of horror movies, I guess. She's more of a strong willed character. Um, it's kind of funny. She, the one, her first scene in the movie is she's has a guy that she's been dating in her, in her bed. And, uh, she gets up and goes to the bathroom, whatever. And then he, it's, it's basically their relationship through the movie. And this is the one thing that I kind of latched onto and I enjoyed about the movie was that he wants more out of like, he wants an official relationship and she's just like, you know, we're hanging out. We're cool. And he's like kind of, kind of chasing her for this real relationship. And that was a, that was a, a, a runner throughout the entire movie that I, I liked and I enjoyed. Um, unfortunately the rest of the movie is just kind of, kind of clunky. Um, there were some, some bits and pieces here and there that just didn't really make sense to me. Um, or, or I guess didn't make sense to me. It doesn't, well, yeah, it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a scene where basically, uh, eh, oh, it's kind of a spoiler. So I won't say it, but, um, there's a scene where it's, it's built up, uh, it's built up to, a, to accomplish a certain thing. And then it seems like the only, re- the, like the shock value of it, uh, didn't pay off the way that it intended to. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll say that. That's vague and, and makes no sense. But, um, one thing that I did really enjoy about it though, is that for a movie that's less than an hour and a half and that has such a, uh, kind of high concept at its core, this, this demonic, evil spirit or whatever that um, can only attack you in darkness Um, for that concept. They really utilized the way that light is, is used in the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, Like it's not just like, Oh, the lights are out. So she's coming. It's more like, okay, the lights, the lights are out. Let's get this hand generated um, um, flashlight that can only, that can only keep power for a few seconds or, let's use candles or let's, let's, um, uh, they go through a ton of different types. It it seems, it almost seems like they sat down to write the movie and they were like, okay, how, what are all the uses of light we can think of? Hmm. (laughs) And they just went through the checklist and did it. And there's uh, some interesting stuff with the black light in it as Hmm. well. Um, and so, so it's interesting, but it also, there's a part of it that just didn't, I couldn't follow the logic of, of the movie. Like it sets up, it sets up a rule and then doesn't really seem to follow it. It kind of gets a little chaotic in, in the ending. Um, and also I swear, God, there's a, there's a line, there's one of the last lines of the movie. Like it's one of those, it's one of those lines where I almost laughed out loud in the theater and, uh, I kind of chuckled to myself because I thought of a, uh, okay. So, so there, uh, I won't, I won't say that. So anyway, it, it made me think of, um, it made me think of a family guy cutaway or a family guy bit that basically um that basically like used this exact trope like there's a line of dialogue that is a cliche and a trope and and really goofy that's used earnestly in the movie uh kind of toward the end that family guy parodied <laughs> um and pointed out how ridiculous it is just as a general thing. And the fact that they thought that it would be a good line in the movie just kind of shows how out of touch they were with the script or how much they should have put, taken another pass at it. But Hmm. that's nitpicking, but it, it really kind of made me chuckle. But anyway, yeah, that's lights out. You said it didn't appeal to you, tiny. Uh, it looked pretty standard to me. Yeah. Although I will say, you know, darkness is a, is a universally kind of scary thing. Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, that, that's I think it's a good idea to make a movie mm-hmm. about it, and like I, it, it, that intrigues me a little bit. But I didn't think it looked that great, right? Yeah, and it wasn't. I think they're already. I mean, I think it said that they uh, working on a sequel, so yeah. maybe the sequel will be better. I think it's been 
moderately successful. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. As far as horror flicks go. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, real quick, I saw a couple trailers uh, connected to it. Um, there was one trailer for, uh, I think it's called Ouija Two: Origin of Evil or something like that. <laughs> um, but that it's funny because I saw that and it looks kind of interesting. It's about a family who, um, uh, like like kind of a, it's a period mo- period movie. Um, I think back in I don't know when the eighteen hundreds or something. Or uh, but anyway, sh- uh, it's a family who makes their money um, pretending to be psychics. And they find a Ouija board and it's, you know, it's a Ouija board and evil stuff. Um, and then also I saw a preview for a movie called Don't Breathe. Have you seen this trailer, Tiny? Uh, yes. It yeah. looks pretty crazy. It does. And uh, when watching the trailer, I was like, I don't know how to feel about this at all. Yeah. I, I really don't. It felt like a, it, it's, it feels, uh, it, it's a movie about a group, uh, uh, I think three people who break into a, um, a blind man's house to steal stuff because they need money because they're in a, a, a crappy town and they want to leave. And so basically they go to this blind man's house and then they get, he finds them and he's stalking them. And so the whole thing is that they're trying to get out, but you know, he has, um, heightened senses because he's blind and it's i don't it looks like it could be incredibly offensive or kind of interesting or i don't know i don't know yeah i'm intrigued by the trailer i'll say mm-hmm. that they, they did a good job on the trailer yeah yep and uh it also looks like it shares some um some atmosphere or something with uh with green room which i thought was a really really good thriller that okay. everyone should check out cool so yeah, so that's lights out and some trailers. Uh, Tiny, what do you have next? Um, so up next, I wasn't going to talk about this originally until it was over, but I can't wait. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the HBO series, The Night of, which is in its first season right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are nine episodes for the first season. They've aired four, I believe. Um, it's 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 really good. Nice man, is it good? I I know we. I can't tell you the last time we really ripped on an HBO show. Mm-hmm. Uh, True Blood, maybe. Ch- yeah, yeah. And even that, we haven't talked about it much. But True it, Detective season two, a little bit. Yeah, that's true. We did rip yeah. on that a little bit. But overall, it seems like any just anything that HBO does is going to be great. Mm-hmm. And and this is just another example of it. Um, nice. I I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's not over yet. Okay. And secondly, it's it's thematically similar to uh, Making a Murderer. Okay. In that it's it's it it shows a negative side of our justice system. Mm-hmm. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um first of all the cast is just the, the entire cast is knocking everything out of the park. Nice. Um John Turturro, who I have always been a big fan of, mm-hmm. this is some of his best work. Nice. Um f- hopefully future guest of the show uh uh, Peter Feckus mm-hmm. uh, posted something about it. I saw that, yeah, yeah, and I was like, I cannot agree with you more. He thinks that he said he said something along, along the lines of John Turturro should win an Emmy, and if mm-hmm. he doesn't, that's crazy or something like that, right? Um, and I, I agree a hundred percent. He is just killing it. Um, but then there's there's a lot of fresh faces. Uh, the main character uh Nas Khan is the character is the character's name mm-hmm. uh the actor uh Riz Ahmed uh, never seen him in anything. I think this is some of his his oh, first yeah. work. He was in uh, Nightcrawler. Oh, was he? I think, yeah. Okay. He played the kind of sidekick. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. He looks a lot different. Um mm. he's 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 very good. Nice. He's a very uh um <sighs> introspective kind of character or very um very secluded um okay. em- emotionally and ex- inexpressively. He reserved, just, he, introverted. Very yeah, introverted. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, a very reserved person and just very quiet. Um and he's accused of a murder. You know, it's just that's what makes his character so interesting. Um so they're both doing great. Payman Moadi plays his father. He's very he's been great so far. Um and but I think my, my second favorite character is played by uh the actor uh Bill Camp which you might recognize. He plays the detective who's investigating this crime. Okay. Um, he, he's referred to, this is not a spoiler, he's referred to as a subtle beast. Okay. His character is a subtle beast. And it, that is just the perfect phrase for his character. Uh, 
man, it's he's he's a by the book detective, except when he isn't. And it's <laughs> it's man, he's just really great. There, there's there's a, one of the episodes is called A Subtle Beast, okay. and it kind of focuses around his actions. I cannot say enough good things about this show. It's it's my my favorite part of it is that it focuses on the details, on mm-hmm. the small things, the minutia that a lot of people are not aware of when it comes to working or being involved in the criminal justice system. Um, all the things like watching a security guard wave a uh, metal detector over a child. It's like wow. just putting that image in your mind, that's a disturbing thing. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a mother bringing her child to visit her husband who's in jail and the kid has to sit there and think why is this happening why is why is this weird man waving this thing in front of my face it's just it just it shows you it visually depicts those emotions and that's just the the show it's it's a weird thing to say but the show is just so visual it it doesn't it doesn't slam things in your face there's not um extroverted dialogue or or superfluous dialogue it's all they show you what you need to see and you pick up on it or you don't and it's it's such a it's a challenging show in that respect um like the way you want to be challenged by a show Mm -hmm. you want to be an active viewer and and they require you to do it with this show and it's incredibly satisfying um there's five episodes left i can't wait to see what happens uh it's it's just a really great show. I I I thought it was going to be a mini series. I thought there was going to be like five episodes. That's what I was going to ask. Uh, I I don't know. There's nine huh. episodes, and I don't know if it's going to be planned as maybe an anthology type show, kind of mm-hmm. like True Detective, or if it's sure. going to be a continuing thing with one story linear. I I don't know. I need I need to read up on it and research it a little bit. But I Ooh. I just don't want anything spoiled. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't want to read too much. You know. Um. But I. Mm-hmm. I, I'd be good for whatever they want to do because they're nailing it. So, um, nice. I, I, I wouldn't say it's quite as good as season one of True Detective. Okay. But it's up there. Nice. It's, yeah. It's good. The, uh, I haven't seen any of it yet, but the trailers that I saw or the one trailer I saw really, um, looks, looked, looked visually a, a bit similar to, uh, to True Detective and that mm-hmm. kind of piqued my interest. So, and the, the trailers don't do it justice in my book. And I will say the first episode is a little bit laborious to get through, mm-hmm. but there are just some intense moments that will keep you on the edge of your seat and will keep you watching that first episode despite its shortcomings. Um, very nice. It's, it's just an incredibly well-crafted show. I, everyone should watch it. It's very good. Sweet. Yeah, I will get caught up on that, and uh, maybe when it ends we can do a bonus episode or something on it. Totes. Yeah, sweet. And... Uh, it's funny you you mentioned Riz Ahmed, um, mm-hmm. and <laughs> it's funny he has had a uh, his career has taken a, a big uh, really upticks recently. Yeah, well, I feel like an a hole. I haven't. I feel like I haven't seen him in anything. <laughs> well, but. that's the thing. Um, he uh, he was in Nightcrawler in 2014. Then he has the Night of currently airing. Um, in December he's going to be in a movie called Rogue One: A Star Wars Story. Nice. <laughs> and then. Uh, this summer he was actually in Jason Bourne. Wow. Yeah. He played kind of a uh kind of like a Mark Zuckerberg analog okay. kind of character. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see him in other roles. Mm-hmm. That's 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 awesome. Cool. And uh okay, so I'm gonna kinda round us out if that's cool. Absolutely. And uh I'm gonna uh your list is I'm I'm gonna switch it up a little bit, so I'm just going like the list that I have for us. This is just for us. But um <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna switch it up. Uh so on the subject of your last one, the night of, um, I recently watched a couple episodes, or I think just one episode, of Adam Twelve, the classic cop show from the sixties and seventies. Don't think I've even heard of that. Okay, so Adam Twelve was created by Jack Webb, who made Dragnet, and his like the whole thing that the kind of thing about it was that it was a true police show. It was like they, um, I believe it was on Dragnet that, uh, I think Jack Webb, right? Yeah. He, um, Jack Webb had offered to pay out of pocket 25 bucks to any officer who, um, submitted a story idea to the show. Interesting. That ended up going through. So, huh. 
Adam 12 was this long running police show where it was interesting to me because, okay, so I'll, I'll start with my perspective on it going in. So I decided to watch it because for anthology on the, on anthology, I reviewed an episode of the Twilight Zone called Mirror Image, which co-starred Martin Milner, who uh, was the star of Adam 12 and who actually just recently passed away in September. So anyway, um, I was kind of curious about M12 because my brother is a big fan of it and I press play and it's a really interesting show because it shows police. It's a police procedural from the sixties and it shows basically, I believe this is how every episode is. It's just a shift for the two characters. It's them answering runs, going on runs and, uh, and it's, you don't really know what to expect each, each, call that they get and so the first episode basically they go um it's one of the guy's first days um so it so the partners are it's um um peter malloy he's played by martin milner and jim reed played by someone i can't think of okay um so jim reed he is the uh rookie it's his first day on the job in the first episode and um milner's character is uh the seasoned cop who he's been on the force for like six years and his partner just died and he's he's thinking about quitting the force so the first episode is all their first patrol together and like they have i think like three or four calls like one is a uh let's see one is just a dispute in the street that gets cleared up pretty quickly then another one is a uh not and this was what was interesting to me one is 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 a uh one is a (laughs) um unresponsive baby Oh wow! And I thought it was really kind of kind of daring to show, you know, them do CPR on a on a baby in the show from I think it was sixty eight. Um, and then also they get a call about like they get into a little chase because of a, a call of a suspicious person casing a casing a business, and so it's just kind of like they're not really connected. It's just you know their thing, and they have some little interpersonal dramas like you know, um, Martin Miller's character is thinking about is. is can, is going to quit the force and he's kind of getting pulled back into uh, sticking on and everything. And so it's the best way I can describe it is that it's really refreshing to watch it because I am so accustomed to these dark, gritty, dour police shows like the shield, the wire, um, um, every other police show that's come out recently (laughs) (laughs) um, that I've seen. And it's all like the anti-hero hero effect. Um, Even, um, um, even, even Hank's scenes in breaking bad were the kind of the same, same way. Like it wasn't obviously that show wasn't a police procedural or anything, but it's still like, you know, they're somewhat the antagonist of the show uh, in a certain respect. And it, it's kind of, it's just so nice to see a representation of what it's like to be an actual police officer, like just doing their job, um, in a show. And what sucks for me is I watched this episode on Hulu and Hulu is kind of absurd in this regard because they only have the show ran for, I don't know how many seasons, but it ran into the seventies and, uh, Hulu only has four seasons and it's only like a few episodes. Like it's, it's maybe a hand, like maybe a dozen episodes per season that it has. So it doesn't have the full seasons and it doesn't have nearly all the seasons, but okay, yeah, but it was, it was really, it was really cool. It was, it was something really refreshing and unexpected from, from my uh, perspective. It ran until 75 and it had seven seasons and each season was like 26 episodes. So, wow. Yeah, so it's a shame that they don't have all the episodes, but I'm intrigued. Really I'd cool. never even heard of that. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh I rec- I I think that you'll really enjoy it. Oh, I'm sure I will. Um yeah, cuz you have that whole history too. Yeah. Um and cool. yeah, I I totally dug it and it made me <laughs> it made me really anxious to like it made me want to go back and watch Chips cuz I grew up watching Chips and loving it. Mm-hmm. And uh it made me want to go back and watch like those old older uh cop shows and then it made me think like we should do an episode about police 
TV shows, and then yeah, then I was like, and then I started thinking like, what episode number would that be? So I was like, okay, well, if we ever do, if we ever make it to episode nine hundred and one, like nine one one, OV nine one one will be our <laughs> police TV. I like it thing. Yeah, very cool. Um, yep. Yeah, so. See you in 15 years. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stay tuned in 15 years for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyway, um, that does it for episode 181 of the Obsessive Viewer podcast. Hopefully episode 181. I don't know if we're going to have, I, I don't know what, it might be a different number. I'm going to cut this out regardless if it is. So anyway, <laughs> episode 181 of the Obsessive Viewer podcast. Um, is there anything else we need to Say yeah, really quick, I want to oh, plug. Good. I will be making uh, additional appearances on my side project, The Secular Perspective. Nice. Uh, thanks to my buddy Chad, who's basically taken that over and, and basically runs that podcast now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I appreciate everything he does. Um, nice. And so I'm going to be back on there uh, for a couple episodes. If you're into that thing, that kind of stuff, check it out. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah, and also, Chad joined the Facebook group. Yes, he did. So guys, be like Chad. Join the Obsessive Viewer Facebook group. Yes. And that's my real plug for it. Also, check out the, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, the My Solo Side Project Podcast Anthology. <laughs> yes, The Study of Ants. That's, no, nope, that's not it. <laughs> but um, no, I'm really excited because I have some good episodes in, in, the, uh, in the works for it. Uh, the next episode I'm going to record is about the, the classic episode long live walter jameson and then after that i'm really excited to talk about the uh episode people are like all over so having said all that i think we're good to go um awesome yep all right and uh thank you thank you for listening guys and uh stay tuned for a uh promo radio promo for sharktober Normington. thanks guys thanks Tickets are on sale now for the third annual Shocktober in Irvington presented by the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Join the hosts of the Obsessive Viewer on October 14th, 2016 at the Irving Theater for a one-night event screening of short horror films, including the premiere screenings of J.P. Lex the Roman the latest entry in his cross-medium Elsewhere World universe, as well as the latest slasher from Snapshot Productions and Billy and Brandon Watch Movies. All of this, and so much more. Come celebrate the horror genre in the historic Irvington area, and get a chance to meet the filmmakers with live interviews after each screening. You can also win DVDs, Blu-rays, and gift cards to Irvington businesses. Tickets are on sale now at shocktoberinirvington.com. All proceeds will go directly to the Irvington Historical Society. And we will see you at the Irving Theater on October 14th. That is, if you dare. Thank you for listening to The Obsessive Viewer, presented by obsessiveviewer.com. You can find more of our episodes at ovpodcast.com And you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast app. The Obsessive Viewer's theme song is An Eclipse of Events and is provided by Loud Like from their EP, Mistakes We Must Make. You can find that and more great music from them on iTunes and like their Facebook page at facebook.com slash loudlikemusic. Any and all feedback on the podcast is encouraged. You can email the hosts individually at matt, tiny, or mike at obsessiveviewer.com or send an email to the podcast in general at podcast at obsessiveviewer.com. Check out the Obsessive Viewer blog at obsessiveviewer.com, where we post movie and TV reviews and the occasional editorial about the business of entertainment. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Obsessive Viewer and follow us on Twitter at Obsessive Viewer, at Obsessive Tiny, and at I am Mike White. If you want more obsessive content in your life, check out our sister site, obsessivebooknerd.com, for book reviews, author spotlights, and a general celebration of reading. Finally, if you're philosophically curious, check out Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com and subscribe to the podcast on the podcatcher of your choice. Again, thank you so much for listening. We love you. Be excellent to each other.